Hi everyone, and welcome to Reasonable and Necessary, brought to you by the Summer Foundation. On today's episode, we're talking to Minister Linda Reynolds about the death of independent assessments. Check it out. Hi Linda, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me, George. Well, I'm very interested to ask you, what's happened at the meeting on Friday with the ministers? Well, George, thanks. It's a great question. And I think it was a very important meeting on Friday for uh, the future of the NDIS. Uh, as you know, and we've had a number of really fantastic discussions about the NDIS, there are, you know, there are a number of issues. And when I became minister, it was really clear that uh, I needed to spend some time listening to people across the spe- sector, particularly those with disability, uh, who, are, who, who have experience with the NDIS. So I did that, and it was, like I said, it was really clear to me uh, that people were very upset. Many people were very upset with the independent assessment trial process itself, and that it was causing distress, uh, you know, across the sector, and particularly. Uh, concerns with people uh, actually on the NDIS. So I called uh, an extraordinary meeting of the disability ministers with the states and territories because ultimately, George, this is not a scheme just for the federal government. This is a real true scheme of the federation and all states and territories have got a lot uh, a lot of investment um, in and, you know, pays great importance on this scheme. So we came together um, three months into me being the new minister. And I think there's, from my perspective, there's three key outcomes uh, of the meeting. Uh, the first oh, one tell is us that... Aha! <laughs> three outcomes, George. Well, there's many more, but these I think are probably the most significant. Uh, the first one is that the ministers heard the message about financial sustainability and cost growth. So what we've agreed is that we're going to work together, all of us, to review the costs, uh, cost drivers and also have a further review of the actuarial report of the insurance scheme and get a better understanding of what the trends are and what evidence underpin, underpins that. And we'll come back together again in August and start having a look at where we think we need to go uh, on sustainability. So... No, no, no rash decisions, but again, working together to make sure that uh, you know, we all want this scheme to, to, to endure for many generations of Australians to come. So that was the first, first one. And of course, we'll you know, have those discussions uh, with people with disability, with, uh, with you know, peak, uh, groups. So it's, I think it's important that everybody in Australia who has an interest in this scheme, including the Australian taxpayers, really understand uh, the, you know, the scheme, where it's come from and where it's going. So, George, that's the first, uh, I think, significant outcome that we agreed to work together on this. The second was we reviewed uh, the IAC report into independent assessments and also the internal report prepared by the N- NDIA. And, it, look, it's really clear uh, that there are many things that needed to be addressed with the current uh, IA uh, trial process. And we agreed with the first recommendation of the IAC report uh, that the trials should not proceed. In fact, the IA should not proceed uh, as they were currently being trialled. So the IAs are dead, but we did agree on a new process to work together and to work together with the sector and to hear, uh, hear, really hear and listen to the voices um, of the disability sector and to hear people's uh, concerns, but also that we do need to find uh, some way to make the scheme more consistent and more equitable, so fairer, uh, because it clearly is not in a whole range of ways. And to do that, we are required under the legislation, so all of us are required uh, to find a new way to um, to undertake a new method to do some form of assessments, but ones that really take into account uh, all of the issues that have come up over the course uh, of the trial as reflected in the reports. 
So we killed uh, the IAs um, and we agreed we'd work together with the sector to find uh, a better way to, to do that. Because, of course, once we've actually got a, a way to make the scheme fairer and more consistent, what we can also do is bring in the personal budget. So we'll look at them together. So the assessments and the budget process and how that is done, because I don't think you can look at one without the other. Um, and so once we've got that, I'd really like to see us get rid of the annual, you know, re, 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 annual meetings and the annual assessments so that once someone's got a plan, you know, we can say, go and live your life, um, you know, strive for your goals and come back in three to five years uh, or earlier if you, you know, you need a plan adjustment. So that was the second uh, sort of, you know, good discussion. Can I, can I clarify on, yes. uh, on that one? Because you said, you know, you said a couple of things there. You said um, independent assessments are dead. Um, you've also said that uh, independent assessments and uh, personal budgets go together. Is that, is that what you meant to say? Or, well, or are you saying that one can, can go without the other? I, 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 don't, I can't see how, one, how we can look at them uh, independently because ultimately it's part of the same process to determine someone's eligibility for the scheme and then work with them on their budget and you know, how you tailor their budget, so, which is the personal budget process. So you know, one, one goes with the other. And I think as part of our discussions uh, with the sector and with people with lived experience is what is the best way to, to achieve that uh, that will be the best, you know, the best experience for participants uh, but also make it a fairer and more equitable scheme. So we've got a lot of discussions to be had, George, over the next uh, few months uh, of you know how we how we achieve that. What what will happen to the contracts that were that were entered into with the uh, the assessors? That's a good question. I've asked the same question of the NDIA. My understanding at the moment is that they're demand driven contracts. And because there's been no demand, uh, then there is little or any uh, cost outstanding or owing. But I'm waiting for some final advice from the NDIA on that. Okay, that's a relief. Yeah, definitely demand driven. And uh, right. there's no demand for them anymore. Thank you. And what was the third outcome? The third outcome was we we're having a discussion about the legislation. Um, one thing that's become really clear to me, George, is that the legislation, the 2012 legislation that established the scheme, uh, was legislation for the concept of an insurance scheme, and it didn't, it, it wasn't sufficient to realise sort of the detail of of an insurance scheme. And so, while some things have worked over the, you know, over that time, over the eight to nine years. The legislation needs updating to deal with the realities of where the scheme is today and, and improvements. So while the legislation itself is a Commonwealth Act of Parliament, um, it's, uh, as you'd be aware, it has different categories of decisions that can be made and most of the, the big decisions, uh, I need unanimous support of all states and territories, which is, you know, in our federation can be a little challenging sometimes. So we had a good discussion about the legislation. Uh, I, uh, so I said that I would not, I confirmed that I would not take any legislation forward this year that hadn't had the endorsement of the states and territories. Um, so what we have agreed and what I've already got uh, going forward is the legislation on for quality and safeguards improvements uh, particularly as a result of the Anne-Marie Smith case, a terrible case in South Australia. So that legislation is going uh, through the parliament at the moment. But I'm also now looking to uh, bring in another package of legislation this year. So that will focus around uh, the TUNE report recommendations, uh, doing the lexical of implementation of that, and also you know, things like the participant service guarantee, but we're also looking at measures uh, to in, 
increase uh, the capability of the NDIA and the AFP uh, and also the Commission to really clamp down on bad behaviour. So we're, here we're talking about fraud and, you know, as you'd be aware, there's been quite a few cases of, of illegal actions uh, and fraud. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me about a lot of cases of really bad behaviour, so gouging, overcharging, over-servicing. So we want to have a look at, at that and bump up our enforcement efforts but also our surveillance. And also um, I think it's important for people, particularly those who self-manage, to, to have a better understanding of what bad behaviour looks like from providers and then what they can do to report it or to, you know, to go to another provider. So that's something I'll take back to the states and territories and uh, once they've endorsed it, uh, we'll take that legislation through this year. Interesting. Thank you. That's that's very helpful to understand how that conversation went. And it sounds like you've uh, certainly uh, stuck to your word when you came in as minister that you said that you would uh, pause and listen and that people have spoken and said that they don't want independent assessments and and now you're you're effectively uh, saying that there will be no more independent assessments. So I just on behalf of, of the second, I just want to thank you for listening. Well, George, thank you. And I, I absolutely meant it when I, I started and when we had our first conversation, um, you made you know some really good points uh, and gave me some really good advice about you know how I should uh, should go about that, and it was really important to me to listen. But there's no point listening if you're not acting. And I, I am very conscious that I'm the ministerial custodian of this scheme uh, between now and the next federal election, and it's quite a pivotal time in the scheme's history. So I wanted to make sure that I use my time wisely. And we do find a pathway as a federation to go you know, to take the actions we need to make sure that this scheme is as best as it can be and it's sustainable. So, you know, that's my absolute passion and commitment now. Thank you for that. I'd like to just uh, turn to uh, the issue of uh, how you're going to work with the sector moving forward. Um, you've made a commitment to uh, develop a person-centred approach yes. around determining eligibility and funding allocations. And this is what the sector's been calling for, and you've committed to that. Have you started to think about what that might look like? I have, and I've had some really good discussions uh, today, in fact, and over the last couple of days with different uh, representatives from the sector. Um, and to try and get a better understanding of what the sector sort of thinks is the best approach uh, to listen and also to make sure that we do have a person-centred uh, approach. So I'm still thinking through that and I'm getting a lot of really good advice. Um, so I won't take too long, um, but I, I'm very open to what that looks like. So I know and I've discovered in this sector that when you use the words co-design, different people have different ideas of uh, what that is. So it's actually finding a, a way that we can, we can, you know, we can really hear what people want and what they think and that we incorporate that into a new, a new assessment model that doesn't just say it's people-centred but really is. Yeah. Co-design is the absolute opposite of what was happening uh before you came in, Linda, so uh, that can be a test for you. Um, <laughs> however, I think that one thing that, that, that we're all on, that, uh, on the same page around what it means is it means uh, what you just said, listening and acting on, on what we say. And I'd also add to that um, some of the things that you've done recently in releasing information and making that information available um, it, it is part of the co-design so that we're all uh, across 
all of the information and we can give policy advice that's very well informed. Well, George, I'll, I will. I absolutely will keep providing as much information as possible because I agree. It's hard to have a sensible uh, discussion if you know everybody doesn't have the same information to base their discussions on. And so I'll, I'll keep doing that. And I've got that commitment from the NDIA and the board as well. So they again agree uh, that we need to do that. So in terms of more specific, more specificity in terms of your question. We'll certainly be working with the IAC and I was very grateful to the IAC members for uh, the work that they did on their report. I think it was a very balanced report. It was uncomfortable reading in some parts, um, but that's a sign of a good report, George, that it's, you know, it's frank and fearless. And I agreed in principle with, with all of their recommendations, as did all of the other state and territory ministers, including their number one recommendation that independent assessments, you know, don't have to proceed in as they've, you know, as we've uh, been doing it. So we will be, and I've had a talk to Rob, Robin Cruck already as chair of the IAC about how we can proceed with them, but also with the DROs involved. And so we're just now having a talk about what that would sort of procedurally that would look like. And as I said, working out how we make sure that we do actually you know, hear from the right people and have that input uh, put into the design of a new assessment model. Yes, and I know that there's uh, a lot of people who uh, definitely have, have a lot of really valuable knowledge to share um, have been in the sector for many years and also families and people with disabilities um, all of which are going to be eagerly um, looking for uh, all the all of the detail around what you're thinking about uh, moving forward so I look forward to um, hearing about um, how the, the person-centred model will, will proceed but it's early days. Uh, it is. It is early days, um, and we'll certainly. I'll certainly keep in touch with with you, George, and um, yeah, as we work through uh, what sort of what that looks like. Can I also just say, George, I'd li I'd like to give a big shout out also to the NDIA staff. You know, it's been a pretty. You know, that I'm sure. All of them go to work every day wanting to make a real difference to people with disability who are on the scheme. And, you know, we've asked governments, you know, all of us as governments have asked a lot of the NDIA staff to, to set up a brand new agency, all of the, the procedures and the practices all at once while bringing in uh, 460,000 uh, participants at the same time. So, it, you know, it hasn't, been, it hasn't been a perfect process, but I think... Hindsight's a wonderful thing and, you know, doing this so quickly, um, it was designed, you know, it, it was uh, possibly inevitable that there would be, be issues. So I just want to sort of give, you know, through, through you a shout out to the NDIA staff um, who are working, you know, with, with great passion and as part of this process I want to make it a better process for them as well. So that they can focus, you know, not on, on these annual reviews, but they can focus uh, more on helping people realise their their life goals and objectives. So uh, I just think it's important sometimes to acknowledge the people uh, who were working so hard to, you know, to, to improve this scheme. Yeah, I think that um, you make a really good point, but. Um, there's thousands of people who are, are really committed to making the, the NDIS work and, and we do need to uh, acknowledge them and, and say thank you for the work that you're doing. Yeah, and, you know, if and because I, I can understand people can get frustrated at the, you know, the person at the other end of the line or the person that they actually meet. But, you know, most often it's because we've got a process in place that's uh, not fit for purpose, which they have to administer. Um, so I think if we can make it a better experience for the NDIA staff as well um, in terms of how we 
you know, we look to improve not just the participant experience, but make it easier um, for the staff to make a real difference. I think, you know, that's that's important too. Absolutely. Can I just address a theme that came up when I uh, I heard your interview this morning with Patricia Cavellas. Um, I think that was this morning. Um, and you mentioned people with uh, chronic illness and uh, died, uh, I think it was on dementia. Um, and, and you said that, that it was never intended for them to be part of the scheme. And I've been following the Twitter feed and um, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to respond to people that might be concerned that, that they're, that, that they're going to be uh, in the spotlight as not being eligible moving forward. I, uh, George, I don't no, think that, that was your intention. No, not at all, George. And as I said, so I became you know, the minister, is that there's a lot of really hard discussions we need to have, you know, as not just as politicians, but also with the sector. And, uh, you know, who is this scheme for? And, um, you know, what does uh, permanent and significant disability mean? What does reasonable and necessary mean? And so it's it's certainly not, you know, it's a conversation. It's not actually saying we're going to, you know, remove anybody from the scheme. And I know there's been concerns about FASD and acquired brain injuries and others, and that is absolutely not the case. But when the scheme uh, was established, uh, there was, you know, there was a much smaller, in fact, psychosocial disorders, also sort of a smaller range, I understand, of people on the autism spectrum, for example, uh, people with uh, dementia. Uh, I, I don't think was ever really sort of considered that they, they should be in the health and the aged care system, not uh, in, in the NDIS. And there's people now who've got a primary diagnosis of a health uh, condition. Uh, so, for example, uh, obesity-related um, disability. So the question really is, uh, is where, does the, where are the lines between aged care, between the health sector, between you know, rehabilitation uh, and also between the NDIS? So it's, I think that's a really important discussion so that we've got clearer boundaries and clear inter clearer and more joined up intersections between those sectors, including housing. Uh, as well, so it's it's part of the scheme being clearer about you know who who is eligible for for what scheme, and you know how do we how do we and if we you know how do we pay for it? Mm -hmm. I think the, the the legislation is clear. It says uh, our permanent disability and. You know, we need to make sure that everyone with a permanent disability that needs ongoing support um, has access to that support. Yeah, and that's a that's that's a, a, a I think a really good discussion point. So part of these discussions is also, you know, for those of us who weren't here when you know the original discussion and debate uh, occurred about the the establishment of this insurance scheme, um, what you know what the initial intent was how it's evolved since then, what are we now doing and who are we now supporting and, you know, where do, where do we go, sort of where do we go from here? So I think that context is really important to sort of get a good idea of, as I said, where we are now, but where we need to take the scheme and how do we, and how do, we do that. And that's not Absolutely. something... Yeah, that's, right. that's not something as the Federal Minister I could or should, you know, have... A, <laughs> have a discussion uh, in the absence of the sector but also with state and territory uh, ministers because ultimately whatever cost the scheme is and wh wh whomever we support uh, has to be jointly funded between us all. So um, it's it's an important discussion, George. It is, and I think that we need to remember that the, the health sector, the housing sector, the, the aged care sector, all those sectors need to... Um, continue to do what people with disabilities need um, from them. Like, they, they have obligations too. They have very important obligations to people with disabilities. It's not just 
the NDIS. Look, George, that is an incredibly important point and it's one that's been made to me many times by many different people is that when the NDIA was established, there was supposed to be a Tier 2 and very strong community-based supports um, for, the, for those people who were not on the NDI, uh, NDIS but also for those on the NDIS to uh, have more community engagement and support as well. So it's been described publicly now that the NDIS has become an oasis in the desert and it should never have been. It should be one of many other supports. So one of the things I did discuss with the state and territory ministers is what does that community-based support, you know, what should it look like? What does good look like? And so that is something else we'll have discussions about over coming weeks and months is with the sector, of course, is how do we perhaps reimagine what community-based support is and then how how do we get there? Yes, that's right. And that's where the National Disability Strategy also comes in. Do you have any information about uh, where that's up to? Because well, we're, we're, we're at the end of one, aren't we? Yeah, so we're, there are a lot of work's been done. Uh, Minister Rustin is leading that piece of work. Uh, in consultation with the states and territories. I believe at our, our next uh, disability reform uh, ministers meeting, which is next month, uh, we will be discussing the NDS again with states and territories because you're right, that is incredibly important. Uh, it would be a, a real tragedy, I think, if the NDIS became the only service and sort of the only real, you know, support for Australians with disabilities because it can't be everything to everyone. We need community-based support as well. Yeah, we certainly do. Before we go, is there anything that you'd like to say about people with disabilities and families that are, are watching? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> Thank you, George. I, I, I always like to give uh, people a chance to talk to the talk to us. Thank you, Look, George. I really appreciate that and. What I can say is that I am in very genuine in my desire to leave the scheme in as good a place as I can once my tenure as the Minister has, has concluded. I'm deeply aware that I am the custodian of this scheme at a, you know, as we said at the beginning, a, a really important point in the scheme's history. So I said that I'd take uh, time to listen and I have and I have acted on what I've heard so far. So, you know, I, like just about everybody else in Australia now, have family members whose lives have been changed by the NDIS, but I, but I know that there are issues uh, that have emerged over the last eight years that we really need to have honest and open and frank discussions about and then make some decisions. But in our wonderful federation, this is a scheme of our federation, and we came together eight years ago, nine years ago, to put aside our political differences and to create this amazing scheme. And it wasn't easy back then, just as it's not easy now. But again, working with the state and territory ministers, I left that meeting on Friday incredibly optimistic that we will find a way, um, you know, over the next couple of years to have those discussions to make the decisions and have this brilliant scheme that is just changing so many people's lives to make it as good as it could be and uh, enjoy. So that's, you know, that's it from my perspective, George. And that's how I see my job. Thank you, Linda. And I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak with me and to the community today. You're very, very welcome, George. Thank you. And just thank you for your passion, your commitment um, and your honesty in your advice to me. Thank you, George. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's all we have time for on today's episode of Reasonable and Necessary. Brought to you by the Summer Foundation. To be notified of future episodes, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Thanks for watching and until next time, stay well and reasonable.